Good afternoon, investigators. It's Mike Evans from the Australian Security Academy, back again with our weekly news for what's going on in the investigation industry in Australia. Today, I'm going to be having a look at the Brownlow Medal. I'm going to be having a look at Hawthorne's troubles with um, a racist complaint about a couple of coaches. We're going to look at some really great jobs. We've got uh, interesting outcomes from a couple of court cases that are relevant to investigators uh, this week. And unfortunately, Casey Pine can't be with us this week, but she'll certainly be back next week. So that's something to look forward to. So here's a photo of Casey Pine when she was two years old. Just when that photo was taken, my wife and I were in Melbourne and it was a beautiful warm summer's um, spring evening. And we went for a walk and Casey was being babysat by our auntie. We were walking around the main street of Melbourne and we heard all this noise in a hotel. And we thought, we wonder what's going on in there. And it was the Elephant and Wheelbarrow Hotel. Now, the Elephant and Wheelbarrow then wasn't the Elephant and Wheelbarrow it is now. It was quite small. Um, but we opened the door and looked in. And there was a lot of noise and there was cheering and carrying on. And it was full of blokes, all smoking, all with a beer in their hand, all, drink, all drinking. And it was the Brownlow medal count from... 1988. There wasn't a lady in the place. It was just full of blokes and it was smoky and um, we shut the door and kept moving. It was just really interesting to watch. And one of the things I try and instill in my students is the idea that when you're planning your business, you don't think about what exists today. You consider what's going to be happening in the future and how things are going to evolve and how things will develop. Now, we saw in Melbourne that Brownlow medal count. G'day, Tracy. Great to see you. <laughs> um, we saw in Melbourne that Brownlow medal count, and that was in 1988. It was a long time ago. If you go and watch the Brownlow medal today, it's not just full of blokes smoking and drinking they're actually health freaks who don't smoke or don't drink anymore but it's all glamour it's amazing so this is what it looks like now there's a red carpet and here's um daniel rioli uh, with his uh, uh girlfriend and her name is paris so there they are at the brownlow middle and here's uh, Josh and Annalise at the Brownlow Medal. This is what it's involved into today. It's a glamorous event. Now, here we have Toby. What's Toby's uh, friend's name? It's Toby and Haley. Haley must be very tall because Toby's tall. So they're at the Brownlow Medal this week in Melbourne. So what does that mean for a business? What it means is in 1988, that event was nowhere near the event it is today. It's evolved. People have um, added a different sort of enthusiasm to that event. And it's sponsored by, I don't know, Toyota or someone like that. And it's all part of a, a big mega corporation of uh, sport and football, which is great. It's health and all that sort of thing. So the people, the players and their partners are having a, a, a chance to dress up and uh, go out and have a good evening. Now, that doesn't mean that that's what you're going to be doing in your investigation business, but you should be thinking about your investigation business in five years' time. In 10 years' time, what are you going to be doing? What developments can you take advantage of to increase your business? As we spoke about last week, the way you win business today is through tenders. Okay, and we talked about the New South Wales eye care tender last week, and um, that that's out and about now, and I don't know whether it's up on the website yet. I haven't had a chance to have a look at it, but I did tell you, uh, you've got to change your thinking. You know, you're uh, not just a single investigator anymore. If you want to win that tender, you're a coordinator of multiple mass investigations with solutions to clients. So keep that in mind. That's really important. When Andy Embers first started to be an investigator, I don't think he ever imagined that 
30 years later, he'd be an author and a book writer as well. And the people would buy his book and you can buy that book. So, you know, you're planning for the future with everything you do. So there's Andy's book, Problem Solved, uh, The True Stories from a Private Eye. And you, you can buy that book and read all about Andy's adventures in Melbourne. Just like my adventures on <laughs> 1988. So planning for the future and being prepared for change, it happens very quickly. It, you turn around and suddenly there's a whole new system, there's new technology, that sort of thing. You, as the investigator, you've got to take advantage of that and be prepared to grow with it. So what are some of the jobs that we've got this week? All the jobs that I'm about to show you, they can be seen on... Um, our uh, Facebook jobs page. So you asked me to get on that. It's Australian Private Investigator, Corporate and Government Investigator Jobs. And we, we've got, there's an enormous amount of job opportunities there this week, apart from uh, last week's jobs are still there as well. The Tasmanian Aboriginal Corporation down in Hobart in Tasmania are looking for a compliance officer. So if you have a certificate for a government investigation, they'd love to hear from you. So Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre down there uh, uh, actively recruiting. Uh, what a great opportunity for a job down there. I think they're paying up to around about $85,000 for that role. It's an in-house role. You don't need a private investigator's licence. This one's available in every state and territory in Australia. It's the Australian uh, Competition and Consumer Commission are looking for senior compliance investigators all around Australia. If you've got a certificate for in government investigation, they want to hear from you, and they're going to pay you two grand a week to work for them almost. So that's a great opportunity if you've got a certificate for in government investigation. Vendor management want to pay you $85,000 in your first year to sit at home and do desktop investigations for them. You don't have to commute. You don't have to travel anywhere. You just do the investigations. So that's a really great opportunity if you're a licensed private investigator. Now, here's a top hint to get this job. They want someone in New South Wales. If you're in Queensland, that doesn't rule you out. All you have to do is get your New South Wales licence as well as your Queensland licence. That means you can investigate in New South Wales. So it's a solution of a lifetime. Vendor management will listen to you if you're a licensed investigator. They will train you up and they will pay you $85,000 in your first year while you're still learning to do that kind of work. So what a great opportunity. Uh, you do not have to go and make appointments and battle the traffic and drive 100 kilometres. You're doing it from home and they've got so much work. They're looking for two people in New South Wales. So if you're in Queensland or Victoria and you're not getting enough work, get your New South Wales licence through mutual recognition and work for vendor management. What a great opportunity. Now, some of the news that's been out this week is uh, this man has been taken to court because the fire brigade arrived at his property and he would not let them in. And during the struggle and the argument and all that sort of thing, the fire, um, one of the fire officers got a broken pelvis. Now, you might think, this is really weird. Well, it's quite common. It happens. So <laughs> it is a fantastic opportunity, Tracy. My word, it is. Uh, don't miss out on that one. It's general insurance and vendor management. They've got a lot of work. Um, so I was a fireman for five years, and we would arrive at a fire at 3 o'clock in the morning in the middle of winter and go to put a fire out of a house that's on fire, and people try and stop us from putting the fire out. It happened very regularly. And one night <laughs> we arrived at this fire at three o'clock in the morning. The, the sirens had gone off. We piled down to the, um, this is in regional Australia. And there's a guy standing there in his leopard print jocks and nothing else. And basically this is what he looked like. He was a pretty fit bloke. But he's going, no, you're not coming in my house. And it's all fire and smoke behind him. And so our... Um, Assistant fire officer, the, the assistant commander, he went and argued with the guy and they got physical and they had a fight. And the assistant fire officer, he got a broken arm as a result of it. Now, we didn't like him. <laughs> Our chief fire officer, we would have died for. He was great, still is a great bloke. He's in his uh, late 90s, still alive today. But we didn't like our assistant. Um, so he's fighting away. Usually we would have just stuck the hose on the bloke to get him out of the way, but it was entertaining watching that. Then while they're struggling on the ground, we went in to put the fire out inside. So you, you really get an idea 
that it's a genuine fire when you arrive because blokes are in their undies, ladies are in their nighties. If they've got dressing gown and slippers on, they're lucky. They really are. If you've got enough time to put that on and get outside in the middle of winter, that, that's a very lucky thing. But they're mostly they're freezing. That's why fire, fire department carry blankets and they'll have, you know, like slip-on shoes and stuff like that, like you get in the motels now, because that's the situation. That comes. People are going to lose everything all their clothes, everything they've got, and that's what happens. And so why did this guy stand there saying, you're not coming in? Well, I don't know why this guy did. I don't know. I have no idea, and he shouldn't have done what he did. The fireman was just doing his job. But this guy was growing dope in his ceiling, and it was the lighting system that started the fire. And that was really common as a, as a um, country fire brigade. Uh, we would find that quite often so that's why he was standing there in his leopard print jocks it was a horrible sight i can't get it out of my memory so um that that's and when you're an investigator and you're doing the general insurance arson claim or the fire because of the loss they've they're insured so you're going and talking to them and taking a statement from them about it uh you will find that you have to go and interview the fire brigade as well and the fire brigade tell you what the scene was like when you were there when they were there, sorry, not you were there. So you must go and do that. And they say, oh, this guy's there in his jocks and he wouldn't let us in. And then we went in and put the fire out and there was a dope crop up there. Now, that may affect their claim or whatever. Who knows? But um, you get a really good idea as a fireman or fire person, ladies, sorry, that uh, you, uh, they have a good understanding of what it was like at the time. That's why they're interviewed. Up in Queensland, there's a great job with the Department of Justice and Attorney General in Brisbane for casino compliance. Now, this is on our Facebook page. You'll need a, I reckon you need a Diploma of Government Investigation for this one. I don't think they've really said that, but they want to pay you $88,000 to um, enforce compliance at the casino. So that's, that's an interesting one um, that's happened. Uh, uh, opportunity this week. This guy <laughs> is wanted in Victoria by the Victorian police. So what he's done, he's gone to a tobacco shop and he has uh, put an accelerant around and he's lit it and he's caused a fire in the tobacco shop. So let's have a look at it. So the police want to talk to this gentleman. He burnt himself in the process. So when he lit the fire, he actually lit himself. So if you know this person and you were standing next to them on the tram or the bus or whatever, and they smelled a bit singed, that's that guy. Now, notice how he rushed around dramatically and the alarm may have been going off. Who knows? So he's rushed around, just like they do on TV programs, and he spread that accelerant around. If you want to burn something around, don't, don't, down, don't do that. Right. What you do is you go very slowly so you don't spill it on yourself and you don't catch yourself on fire when you're doing that sort of thing. Um, fuel, they all use uh, some kind of fuel like petrol. Uh, so it's they go to the service station and buy it. And of course, they're all caught on camera there where they do it. So that's it's just a, a numb nuts thing to do. The guy wasn't very good. If you look at the video at the beginning and you replay this in, on the replay tomorrow, you see him walk straight out the back of the shop. He knew where he was going. That's quite interesting. So he could be a former employee or, uh, you know, it could be who knows who he was or what his motive was. That'll come out later on. We'll find out. I'm sure this is quite high, high profile. So if you know this guy, the Victorian police would be very interested in hearing from you. Now, this happened in Ballarat. 
I went to court one day in Ballarat and I was going into court. There's this nine-year-old outside the court <laughs> with a rat's tail <laughs> and he's smoking. <laughs> and I walked past him <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Love Ballarat. So if you're in Ballarat, you know this guy. <laughs> I don't think he was the nine year nine year old to be thirty now. So, <laughs> so other news this week down in the love machine. This guy has been sent to prison for at least twenty nine years. He's the person that um, shot the people outside the love machine down in Victoria. If you've had experience as a security guard in the nightclub industry, you probably received five or six threats to be shot a week um, by people who are going to go home and get a gun and come back and do it. Well, this guy basically had a gun somewhere and uh, two people he killed. So the driver of the car, because he didn't shoot them, the driver of the car didn't shoot them, he's going to jail for 26 years because he drove the car, which the killer used to use the gun to shoot it. So he knows that the killer had a gun. So it's like bank robbery. If you're the driver of the getaway car and you know that the robber has a gun and that that robber kills somebody, you're just as guilty as, of murder as the person that did it. So that's what happened at the love machine, and I hope you rot in hell. Mate, yeah, that was just a stupid thing to do. Other news, in everything's happening in Victoria this week. <laughs> there was a bus uh, crash in Victoria. 33 people injured some kids at 4 o'clock in the morning on the way to an overseas trip, school kids. This is awful, really is awful. So... Um, the bus was taking them, uh, they were going to fly out and go overseas and it uh, got rear-ended and knocked down an embankment. So those people, 15 of them, are still in hospital. Uh, this happened earlier in the week. They're still in hospital today. This is a pretty bad accident. Now, what happens in these sort of situations? They're covered by the Transport Accident Commission. <laughs> DJs get threatened all the time, <laughs> Evan, they do. <laughs> Evan's just said that uh, DJs get um, get death threats when people are going to go home and get a gun and come back and shoot them because they won't play their crappy song they want to listen to. So, yep, I thoroughly agree, mate. It's <laughs> glad I'm out of it. <laughs> so... So the TAC in that bus accident, so what's going to happen there is they're going to cover the people for their injuries, for their uh, loss, for their recovery and um, health care. This is what the TAC, Transport Accident Commission, do in Victoria. So you as the investigator, you'll be interviewing the owner of the bus service and you'll be interviewing the bus driver uh, you'll be interviewing the people, the first responders, the fire brigade, the ambulance, that sort of thing. You'll be taking statements from them. There'll be quite a few investigators involved in this one because you won't be investigating um, 33 people all by yourself. There'll be other investigators from your organisation that will investigate some of the other people. Now, if those people are under 16, which is possibly they could well be, um, they will have to have their parents present and you'll be getting a statement from them about what happened. This is going to be a very expensive claim. So you, the investigator, will, it's your responsibility to go out and talk to those people. Now, it's a horrific accident, really horrific. And what saved the lives of the people in that case of that bus um, was the fact they had seatbelts. So it's a great thing that they have seatbelts today. They didn't have them when I was a school kid, <laughs> that's for sure. Down in Tasmania, another thing that's happened down there, what we've got is uh, an orchard has been fined for violating workplace health and safety. Now, nothing happened. No one was injured, but they didn't do what they were told to do as far as um, their workplace health and safety to reduce um, the exposure of risk and death and serious injury at workplace. So they've been taken to court and they've got a pretty hefty $40,000 fine in relation to not complying with workplace health and safety directions by the Office of Workplace Health and Safety down there, which is Workplace Standards Tasmania. So again, the people that will run that case, they have a certificate for in government investigation from the Australian Security Academy. And basically what happens when you have a certificate for in government investigation, you enforce regulatory compliance 
on behalf of a government department. In this case, it's the workplace health and safety regulatory compliance that you're doing. Now, the way to think of this as a government investigator, it's like what your mother used to do to you. She used to say to you, look, eat your vegetables and you can have some ice cream. And if you don't eat your vegetables, you're not getting any ice cream and you're not getting any TV. Okay. So your mum is enforcing compliance on you. Now, you didn't want to comply because you can't stand cauliflower, right, and you didn't want to touch Swedes. Uh, you might have had some potatoes if they were fried. <laughs> but you don't want to eat peas, right, but your mum's enforcing that regulatory compliance with you. She's making you eat your vegetables. So this is how you think about that as the investigator. You make organisations comply. They have to eat their vegetables. That's your role, okay? So that's what you do, not as a private investigator, but as a government investigator. So think of it in terms of that. They don't want to comply, right? But you're saying to them, not so much eat your vegetables, mate. You're saying, look, you've got to comply or I'm going to give you a fine. And that fine is $165. And then if you don't comply, I'm going to give you another fine. And it's going to be... Even worse, it's going to be $40,000, like it says there in that last paragraph there. Now, I am the chief executive officer of a registered training organisation called the Australian Security Academy. I have to comply with what the regulator, ASQA, the Australian Quality Assurance Service or something, whatever they are, <laughs> I've failed that test already, what they tell me to do. So they've got rules and regulations and they've got the NVR Act and all that sort of If I don't comply with that as a CEO of a registered training organisation, I can be fined as well. And there's been a recent case of a registered training organisation in uh, Queensland being fined by the federal court. Now, that registered training organisation was um, Rose Training out of Brisbane, Australia. Now, what they did... Rose Training. This is a federal court case. You can see it there. You can um, replay this tomorrow or replay it at your leisure. And you can look up that case and see it. Commonwealth of Australia versus Rose Training Proprietary Limited in the federal court. And basically it's precedent for all RTOs. What they did, they issued eight qualifications that they didn't have on their scope of registration as a registered training organisation. Now, ASQA, the regulator, found out about this. They confronted Rose Training about it, and Rose Training cooperated with them. Decent people, they cooperated. They didn't, they didn't deny, um, delay and defend and make this an extraordinarily um, expensive matter. They basically put their hand up and said, look, sorry, we didn't realise that. We thought we it, when it stopped... Um, being on our scope of registration, we thought that one would automatically transfer into the next one, but it didn't. Now, every registered training organisation in Australia is warned about this. So you in private investigators, you had the CPP 30607, that changed to the CPP 30619. And you have to um, study that new one, right, as a private investigator if you're going to enter the industry or in New South Wales if you want a licence or renew your licence. You have to comply with that. Now, me as the RTO, I've got to have the assessments and the resources for that CPP 30619. I can't have it for the old CPP 30607 because it went two years ago. It's the new one now. So Rose Training um, put their hand up and said, look, we're sorry, we, we didn't mean to do it. And there was no intent of fraud there. That It wasn't in their mind that they were going to do this fraudulently. It never occurred to them. They just didn't know. They missed a meeting or, or something like that. They're otherwise a decent organisation, law-abiding, eat their vegetables, that sort of thing. In the federal court, they were fined $23,000 for eight diploma of um, vocational education qualifications issued to students. Now, that is a lot of money. They also had to pay $46,000 in court costs. So only eight qualifications were issued. It was $23,000. That's a substantial amount. And the investigators working for ASQA 
they would have gone interviewed the people at Rose Training, interviewed the eight students who have paid their money and now they're going to have their qualifications taken off them. So Rose Training did the right thing. Uh, they, they may have, I don't know, they may have refunded the money to the students they paid or whatever, you know, and they went somewhere else. The Rose Training is still an RTO. They didn't shut them down. Now, the really important thing here is ASCA concentrated on rebuilding and moving forward with Rose Training, not parading their head around on a stick, right, which everybody thinks that's what you've got to do as a government investigator. No, they're helping you to comply. So my point here is that's one RTO and one situation of eight people, $23,000 plus $46,000 in court costs. If you own a loss-adjusting firm in Australia and you want to avoid that, get in touch with Mike Evans, me, 0407-593-881 as urgently as you can. Other things that have happened this week, we've got a um, HR a, uh, investigator, human resources investigator down in Q. Um, so they're looking for that down in Victoria. Great opportunity down there. Oh, no, come, come back to that one in a minute. Um, done the casino investigator, the uh, TAC, I'm thinking that's Transport Accident Commission down in Victoria, it's a Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre. Uh, <laughs> investigation offer at Suncorp down in Brisbane, great opportunity there. Probe down in Melbourne, one of the most established investigation agencies in Australia. They have an opportunity down there for a factual investigator who is licensed, so you must be licensed. There's a travel insurance investigator, uh, disputes person, wanted in eye cover, uh, one cover. That, that's a great opportunity down there. ABI are still looking for investigators, factual investigators in uh, New South Wales, and Quantum Corp are looking for factual investigators in Tasmania. I reckon if you get in touch with Quantum Corp or ABI or vendor management, they'll listen to you. They need investigators at all those places, including Probe as well. The other place that we're constantly pushing of late is... Clarity down in Victoria, they're looking for factual investigators as well. You're going to have to go out and take statements off people. This isn't a desktop role. You're going out and driving there, meeting them and talking to them. So Clarity will take on you as a beginner and give you an opportunity to then enter the industry. And so will Quantum Corp. So will vendor management and pay you $85,000 in your first year. My first year as an investigator, I probably earned $10,000 <laughs> and I was flat out. <laughs> that was a long time ago. There are different rates now, all that sort of thing. So the other um, job that came out last week, Woolworths are looking for a uh, fraud uh, lead person at the Woolworths Group. So you can see that on our Facebook page. And down in Tassie again, as I pointed out last uh, week, Cyber Solutions down in Georgetown, they're after investigators down there. So get in touch with Dwayne at C Cyber Solutions. And uh, again, you're going to be working as a desktop investigator. And it doesn't matter. You could be in Darwin probably and do that job. I'm sure they'd listen to you if you're a licensed investigator and you've, you've got some experience. So that's something to consider. Now, the one thing that came out, it's a bit AFL-y this week. I understand that. The Hawthorne Football Club, uh, Chris Fagan was an assistant coach there, and there's been a big uh, kerfuffle this week about racism at the Hawthorne Football Club a couple of years back when they won three grand finals. Now, it's hit the news. It's a reputational risk for the AFL. Chris has stood down from his role as coach at Brisbane and he says, I intend to defend myself. It's my hope that people will judge me based on the way I actually conduct myself and not um, what's written in the media. I support and welcome the investigation announced by the AFL. And Chris um, has come out and said all that. Now, he's got all this pressure on him um, of some allegations about racism and um, that sort of thing going back to when he was assistant coach. And it's the whole of club thing. I grew up with Chris. Here's Chris receiving the Best and Fairest Award in our hometown back in 1976 from Cole Johnson. <laughs> and uh, Chris would have been, crikey, I'd hate to think how old he would have been then. He might have been around about 
16, 17. There he is in that photo on the right-hand side. I actually saw Chris play his first ever game of football. He was two years in primary school football. He was uh, two years younger than all the 11-year-olds playing. And he was a really small person at that stage, really small. Um, he, he wasn't as well-developed as the older kids. But the thing was, he was so tenacious. You get a big kid running down the uh, wing like Michael Jones or Kim Matheson, and uh, Chris would tackle them. Now, it had no effect. It would be like, to them, it was like being hit by a, a pillow or, or a tea towel. But Chris would hang on. <laughs> He'd ride on their back like he was being piggybacked. He wouldn't let go. Um, they didn't know he was there because he was so small. But I tell you what, you just knew this guy was so determined to be a great footballer. And he was. He, he, he was a great footballer in Tasmania and he played for the Hobart Football Club and he went on to coach Clarence to several uh, finals and he's coached at AFL level now. And he's very humble about it. And growing up with Chris in the town where that photo was taken, this is the interesting thing. That town, if you do your research, Queenstown, Tasmania, has the highest population of Aboriginal people in Tasmania. Not so much today, I think about third highest today. Back when Chris was playing footy here, it was always the first highest. And he grew up in that town with all those people who were of Abor Tasmanian Aboriginal origin. Now, I spoke about the Tasmanian um, Aboriginal Centre had a job advertised today for a compliance officer for their aged care facilities and stuff like that. Chris is growing up in a town that's got more Aboriginals in it than anywhere else. I'd go to social events with Chris. I um, bump into Chris quite often in Hobart when we were walking around and you might not have seen him for three years. He's sly, he would light up the mall in Hobart, always pleased to see you, great person. And now he's been accused of racism from way back and he knows nothing about it. He doesn't know what he did. His background is growing up with Aboriginal people in the highest population of Aboriginal people in Tasmania. I've been to social events and never even heard him tell an Irish joke. I've never ever seen him drunk. <laughs> um, very committed health person, very committed um, footballer and a very committed coach. I don't think he's so committed he'd tell someone to uh, terminate a pregnancy. I don't, I, I don't, could not imagine that. So Chris is uh, basically in the news and there's been allegations. Now, the AFL investigators are going to have to go out and speak to him and say, these are the allegations. What do you say to that? So what's Chris going to do to defend himself? They're going to say, on this day, date and time, you did this. And Chris is going to go, mate, that was seven years ago. <laughs> how, do, how am I going to remember that? So his defence is going to be a time and event line. Where he was. His phone records his Facebook posts, his coaching diary, his appointments diary. Now, I'm sure, even as assistant coach, someone would have been making Chris's appointments for him at that senior level. So they'd be keeping records of uh, meetings and that sort of thing, who he spoke to. If this, if this is formal meetings for coaching and stuff like that, and they'd bring the players in each week and they'd talk to them about this or that, and there'd be records kept of that. Now, Chris has got to find those records, and have access to them, and Hawthorne have got to hand them over. And that's what his defence will be is, well, you're saying I did this on this day, date and time. No, I was here. How could I have done that? So that's how this kind of thing goes together. Why is it hitting the headlines? Why is it such a big deal? The media are going to dine out on this. They're going to say, oh, you know, all these players got paid all this money and these coaches got paid all this money. And they're going to basically crucify anybody they can to get attention in the newspaper or the TV. And they're, you know, they're judging before Chris has even had a chance to say he's had to step down from his Brisbane coaching role. I seriously doubt that Chris would have done the things that have been alleged. Seriously doubt it. Good on you, Chris. You're a great bloke. You always have been. And um, I, I always valued our friendship and with your brother too. Yeah. So, um, I don't think that's really fair. Anyway, people, that's what we've had this week. So this week we've covered quite a bit of ground. So Brownlow Metal, it's a lot of fun. Um, 
have done that. The bus accident, you're going to get have to get used to those sort of things. General insurance, fire investigations, be prepared to see anything. We, we've arrived, we arrived at um, fires where people were butt naked. They didn't even have their undies on. That they, they the blokes sleep naked. That's what happens. So, so a lot of a lot of things there. Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre, like I said, got great opportunity down there for a quality and compliance officer. Um, really great opportunity for that. If you're in Tasmania, you've got a, a certificate for or a diploma in government investigation. And a whole lot of uh, great opportunities there. A little bit of investigation news. And uh, thanks for watching. Casey will be back next week. Uh, I'll be back next week as well. We'll see you then. Something you look forward to. Huh. Well, now that's our show for this week. That was episode 167 of Spy Curious. If there's something there that you enjoyed or you would like to see again, Watch the replay on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Here's our YouTube channel. You can um, watch anything you want to replay there and stop it so you can actually see it. So just type in Michael Evans PI, Australian Security Academy on YouTube, like 155,000 other people have, and you can replay that event. If you are the manager of a loss-adjusting firm in Australia, get in touch with me. See you next week, people.